Um, if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to go ahead and I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We're just going to go ahead and, and park the car right there and, and we'll get to it here in just a moment. But I want you to go ahead and go to Ephesians 6 or if you pronounce it, Epihesians chapter 6. Tomato, tomato, however you prefer. Um, and then we're going to start at verse 10. Everybody say verse 10. Say verse 10 again. Awesome. Pastor uh, Rhonda was telling me last week, she was like, you know, I really believe that, that we're just going to start seeing people bring uh, real Bibles to church again. She's like, more, just more real paper Bibles. And I was just like, amen. I receive that. Just I'm right there with you, Pastor Ron. I believe that with all my heart. <laughs> I'm going to have to have to dig up my, uh, my real Bible. I've gotten so used to using my Bible. So Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. <sighs> take a breather there for a second. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after having done everything, everybody say everything, to stand, then stand firm. All right, we're going to park, we're going to just, we're going to put the car in, in park right there. I don't, I don't know why I'm talking about cars and parking so much. We're going to put it in park there. So I want to just kind of recap what we just read so far, okay? Basically, in Ephesians 6, Paul is telling us that there is a fight, okay? There's a war. There's a fight going on. And our fight is not against what? Flesh and blood, which would be what? People, all right? You're good. Hey, you're smart. <laughs> Our fight is not against flesh and blood. So there's a fight and there is an ongoing war. There's a battle taking place in the heavenly realm. But the fight is not against flesh and blood. So it's not against people. It's against dark forces and powers and authorities in the heavenly realm. So I'm going to say this in the most simplest terms that I can. I want you to, I want you to hear me. Demons are real. Sit over here. Demons are real. Demonic forces exist. Now, you might say, hold on, preacher, this is getting a little weird. This sounds a little bit like fairy tale stuff. You've been watching too much Disney Plus, all right? You, th what's going on here? You're talking about magical forces and evil spirits and all this kind of stuff exists. Yes, it exists. Now, I'm sorry in advance, camera person, for doing this to you. Um, I, I want to ask you a question, though. If you've ever had a hard time grasping or believing that demons are real or that there are forces and there are authorities like Ephesians 6 talks about, then I want to ask you a question. I, I maybe have done this before, but I want to ask you this. Okay, how many of you believe in Christmas? The, the Christmas story, I'm not asking you if you believe in the holiday Christmas or whatever, because I know some people are like pagan, not pagan, whatever, but I'm saying actual Christmas story that Jesus was born. How many of you believe that? Okay. I'm going to ask again because I thought I saw a few hands down. I hope everybody believes, but it's fine. If you don't, it's cool. By the end of the service, you will. So if you believe that the Bible says that Jesus came to this earth, raise your hand. Nice. Okay. So what you're telling me, well, let me ask this question before I get to the next point. Acacia, in order, in order for a, a, a child to be conceived, there must be something that takes place first. We won't go into detail. I see some little ones that aren't in children's church this morning. So is that true? There must be something that takes place before a child is conceived, correct? Correct. All right. And we're coming up on February. All right. Huh? The love month. Okay. So some of y'all, some of you husbands go ahead and get ready. Go ahead and start planning your romantic night with your wife. Okay. All that cool stuff. If you're not married, um, don't be doing the, 
the things she just said. Okay, so now you believe that in order for a baby to be born, there must be some type of activity, physical activity that takes place. And I do know that there are medical procedures nowadays where it can be done, but there still is some type of medically, scientifically thing that has to take place. There has to be a fertilization. Are you understand what I'm saying here? It, there has to be. D do you deny this, Sarah Beth? I don't. So you're telling me that you believe in the Christmas story. I do. But you also believe that there has to be some type of physical fertilization to take place in order for a woman to get pregnant. Yes. Well, hold on now. Mary didn't have that physical fertilization take place. But you believe in Christmas? I do. Well, you're crazy. You're all crazy that you believe a woman became pregnant without that. And you know what that is. You're crazy. You believe that? Oh my gosh, you are so insane for believing that. See, demons don't seem so unbelievable now, do they? And I hear so many people all the time talking about, oh, demons aren't real, or that stuff's not real, or speaking in tongues is not real. All of that stuff is, is, is outdated. And, and I look at these people, and I think to myself, then you believe that a virgin was pregnant? You're, that's crazier to believe. Honestly, that is crazier to believe that a virgin woman could get pregnant. But yet it happened. And every single one of you raised your hand and said you believe it. So if you, if you believe that craziness in the Bible, then do not have a hard time believing that there are actual demonic forces at work. And they are real. And there's a real battle. There's a real war every single day. And our battle, our fight is against these demonic forces. This is not fairy tale stuff. This is real. There's a real enemy, and he's after you. He's after your kids. He's after your marriage. He's after your life. There's a real enemy. Amen? So now that we've established that, okay, I want to kind of break down exactly what does that mean. So, so there's this, this ruler, this authority, this power, this, this dark spiritual force that we're up against. And I want you to understand, most of you in here maybe already know a little bit of this origin story of Lucifer. But I want you to know, in, in case somebody doesn't know this, the devil, Satan, before he was the devil and Satan, he was actually an angel in heaven. All right, an angel. He was literally an angel, and not just any angel. He was the most beautiful angel. And not just the most beautiful angel, but he was also the worship dude. All right, I don't think it's a coincidence that he was the most beautiful and he was also the worship leader. <laughs> now, I'm not taking the Bible and twisting it for my own selfish affirmation here but um it's the word <laughs> so he was the most beautiful angel he was the the worship leader and the bible even talks about that his body was made of rubies and stones and rare just emeralds and all these beautiful colors in fact pastor philip um i i preached this um once before in young adults a couple of weeks ago and i promise you you're not getting seconds okay but i did find out like at nine o'clock last night that i was preaching this morning so have a little mercy on me but pastor philip after i preached came up to me said you know what's really interesting about the bible talking about that he was um you know just endowed with beautiful emeralds and stones and all of these precious um, rubies and, and, and things. And I was like, what's, what's that, Pastor Philip? He said, all of those things, they had color and light would pass through him and they would uh, emit these beautiful colors. And I was like, what? I, I mean, yeah, I guess I should have realized that, but I never like thought about it in that way. He's like, yeah, so think about it. That light and colors are just as much a part of worship as music. And I was like, what? 
So you're telling me that all the lights we have on stage are worship? You're telling, you're confirming. So, and I'm not just trying to make an excuse for um, for the light show up here by no means. But understand this: that it is, it is a beautiful thing. And, and how many of you enjoy when you see? I'm just gonna kind of give a shout out to our our light people back there. I think Reagan did lights this morning. Reagan, who usually sings on the stage, she she did lights for us. She did a phenomenal job. But how beautiful is it when you're just about to hit that that bridge? or that chorus of that song and that just that big part and you see these beautiful lights just change colors does anybody in here just love it when you see that maybe you've never noticed it before but maybe you'll notice it now but we really try our best in worship and to get the lights to go with the music it's not for oh thank you thank you it's not it's not for show it's for him it's it's worship and and i'm telling you heaven is full of color Do you know there are colors in heaven that you've never seen before? Could you imagine seeing a color? I can't even, I can't even think of a color that I've never seen before because I've never seen it. But to imagine that heaven is full of colors that you've never laid your eyes on. You, you can't even fathom or begin to even think about it existing, Pastor Amy, because you've never seen it. That's how big our God is. And these beautiful colors. So when you see us do that, and, 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 and I could really try to get spiritual here. When you see the haze, the haze in the air is usually so that way it captures the beam of the light breaking through. But if you want to get spiritual about that, you know, the Bible talks about the glory of God would, would descend as a cloud. Could you imagine? And, and the cloud, and, and I just, all through scripture, I hear like thunder. And I think about when Beck or Carter hit those drums and the... The thunder, the bass just fills the room and the music and all of these things come together and you've got Michael over here and he's all of that stuff and he's, he's got these beautiful and, and he's playing the stringed instrument. You know, back in the day, um, Michael would probably be playing the harp. Because that was like the mainstream instrument back in the day, okay? So Michael would be a harp player. But now, all right, the modern day David, all right, would play an electric guitar, probably just like Michael's, all right? Because Michael has the best of the best. I mean, this whole pedal board costs him like $200. That's a lot of money. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, Michael. <laughs> no, honestly, this entire, I know I'm going off on a rant here, but this entire thing, uh, Michael is not afraid to invest into his his music, this whole thing probably cost him like $7,000, right? Yeah, he's shaking his head, yeah. So if anybody wants to sew into Michael and, uh, <laughs> and um, <laughs> look at him, hallelujah, he's having a breakthrough back there. <laughs> so all of these things, they, they join together, they come together. Even the piano is a stringed instrument and there's not physically strings on this, but it represents that. And all of the, 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 the beautiful voices, the harmonies, all of it comes together. The lights and the, the, the haze in the air and, and everything, it all comes together as worship. And think about this. Lucifer had all of that in one package. All of it. He had the light. He had the sound. He had the music. There's even scriptures that allude to that there were, there were instruments literally made into his body. Think about that. He was all of that. He's the most beautiful angel. But pride set in. Pride set in. And Lucifer got a little full of himself and thought, I can ascend higher than God. I'm better than God. And as soon as that happened, somehow, Pastor Regina, he convinced a third of the angels in heaven to follow after him. A third of the angels, they followed, they believed his lie, that he was better than God, that he could ascend higher than God. And as soon as that happened, as soon as that set into his heart, the Bible says God cast him from heaven. He cast him out with the angels that chose to follow him. And that is where Satan and his demons become or, or, or whatever. Can't think of the word to say. <laughs> and that's where they were. Um, so what's crazy to me is when you look throughout the history, and I'm going somewhere with this because I want you to understand 
if our fight is not against flesh and blood and our fight is against these authorities, our fight is against these powers, our fight is against these rulers and these dark, demonic spirits, then you have to understand, even Isaiah could tell you, you have to understand the strategy of the enemy. That's a big key in victory in a battle or a war, right? You have to study. And in fact, Isaiah, you're in intelligence communications-ish. He can't tell me or he'd have to kill me. So... Um, <laughs> He does something for the government, okay? And, and he studies out. I'm sure him and his colleagues, they, they strategize against the enemy. They, they, I know the military. I wasn't in the military, but I know the military will, will try to intercept phone calls and intercept uh, things through the computer and try to study out. I mean, they've been doing that even long before there were computers. I mean, I've seen movies. I know how it works. So, but it's important to understand the strategy of the enemy. And, and, and I want you to get this because there's, there's, one, there's one play that Satan has in the book. Just one. There's one play that he has. He uses it every time, no matter what, to get everybody. That one play, though, can come in many different forms. But it all roots back to just one little tactic that he uses on everybody. And it's the same tactic that he used in heaven when he convinced the angels to follow him. It's the same tactic that he used in the garden when he convinced Adam and Eve to fall. And it's pride. I'm going to say that again. It's pride. It's pride. Why? Because he thought he was better than God. He thought he could ascend higher than the throne of God. What do you think he did with Eve when he was in the garden? Surely God didn't say you would die, right? He didn't say that. And, and, and this is the tree of knowledge and good and, of good and evil. Like, how come he only gets to know stuff? <laughs> Don't you want to know stuff too? Imagine what you could do if you knew what he knew. You might even know it better than he knows it right? I know God told you not to, but, but you know better than God. You know better than him. You trust yourself. Trust yourself. You can do this. And what does she do? She fell for that prideful tactic. And most people think, well, that's not really pride, is it? That's disobedience. But you understand that disobedience stems from pride. Because, even think about a little child, when a little child disobeys their parents, why do they disobey their parents? Because they did what they wanted to do, not what their parents wanted them to do. Amen? So therefore, they tried to ascend higher than the parents. Some of you kids in here, preach to you for just a moment. When you don't listen to mommy and daddy, you're doing what the devil did when he was in heaven. You're trying to ascend higher than them. You're trying to say that you know better than mommy and daddy. Mommy and daddy told you, clean your room, but you know better, right? So you're not going to clean your room. You're going to play your Xbox. You're going to play your PlayStation. <laughs> mommy and daddy told you to take the trash out, but you didn't do it. Why? Because you're like, it don't need to be taken out because I know more than mommy and daddy does. You just tried to sin higher than mommy and daddy. Hmm? Or if you're a single parent, higher than daddy, higher than mommy. Or if you're a grandparent, raising your grandchildren, higher than granddaddy, higher than grandmommy. People say grandmommy. <laughs> that's, what, that's what our child's going to call my mom is grandmommy. <laughs> she would not like that. Um, <laughs> think about that, though. It all stems from selfish pride. It all stems from, from selfishness and pride that says, I know better than God. I can do better than God. When God tells you or prompts you to go pray for that person in public and then you don't do it, you thought you knew better than God did in that moment. And you operated out of pride, therefore producing disobedience. Pride and the word also says, just like what happened to Lucifer when pride set into his heart, pride comes before the what? And the Bible says he did what to Lucifer and his angels? He cast them out. They fell from heaven. They fell from heaven. So I'm telling you, the, 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 the word is full 
of heaven's strategy, but it also reveals Lucifer, Satan's strategy, and it's the same old trick every single time. Even I, I could think of a, a thousand different stories in the Bible, but even with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what were they asked to do? They were asked to bow down and worship someone other than the one true God. They were prompted and asked, just like everyone else in that area was asked, to worship someone, putting that person, putting the king higher than their God. You see, Satan's agenda is to always get you to think that you can ascend higher than God. That's his tactic. So now that you know, you need to look for that. When you are tempted, when you have moments in life and you think to yourself, well, I know better in this situation, or I'm going to trust my gut. Don't please, don't ever just trust your gut, okay? <laughs> trust Holy Spirit. Don't trust your gut, all right? And look, I got a lot of gut to trust, but I'm going to tell you right now, I'm in my third trimester. No, um, <laughs> Hannah's like, do you feel the baby kick? I was like, do you feel the baby kick? I'm about to kick right here. Oh, no, that was the chicken wings I ate last night. Um, but think about that. Every time his tactic is to get you to try to ascend higher. Whenever you took that job and you knew God said, this is what I really wanted you to do, but you took out of, out of what you thought was best for you and your family and you disobeyed God, right? That's pride. Because you thought you knew better. All right? When you are in an argument with your spouse and you know you did wrong. You know you did wrong. You know it would, but you are too prideful to admit it. And you're too prideful to say you're sorry. And I'm preaching to myself here because that's happened before. I, I, it's very rare that it happens on my end. But now I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Somebody's saying pride. Um, but think about that. I'm just trying to give you practical examples, but you, but you get in that argument with your spouse or your home and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, I know, but it's still just aggravating. And you have a hard time admitting that you were wrong. Well, that's pride. That is pride. And you are doing exactly what Satan did that got him out of heaven. And this is what I told the young adults that night. I was like, listen, I'm, this wasn't just any ordinary angel. This was Lucifer. He was the angel in heaven, okay? He was the most beautiful worship music literally just emitted from himself. I mean, he was, in, in, in retrospect with the angels, he was it, Okay, he was the stuff. The unfortunate thing is he began to realize that and think that of himself. Instead of looking at the, the, the amazing beauty that he was creating, instead of giving it to glory to God and saying, this, I, I'm only this because of God. I'm, look at how amazing God is. Pastor Gina, I'm sure you had this moment when, when your, your first child was born and you held your baby, right? There. Look, you got baby, mama's baby right there. Did the thought cross your mind when you held him for the first time? Look at how amazing God is. That he formed this. That he made this. And only if Lucifer could have done that. Could he have just looked at himself and said, look how amazing God is. Look how beautiful the works of his hands are. That he could do this. That he would use me. But instead, he began to think, well, this is me, and I did this, and I can keep doing this, and I can ascend higher. And I told the young adults, I said, why do we think this is Lucifer, all right? This was not just some ordinary angel, and yet pride lost him his position in heaven. Why do we think we're any better than that? That when pride sets in our heart, that we won't have consequences, are you hearing what I'm saying here? Why do we think that if Lucifer lost his position in heaven as the worship leader in heaven, okay, pride cost him that. But we think it's okay to operate in pride and it won't cost us anything or there won't be any consequences on our end. Oh, it's fine. We'll get over it. We argue all the time. We'll get over it. It's fine. And what you don't realize is every time you don't humble yourself in the relationship, you are just chipping away and eating away at your relationship with your spouse. Oh, we'll get over it. It's fine. We'll work it out. We'll sleep it over. We'll sleep it out. It's fine. It happens all the time. And you don't realize it. And I'm sure 
Miss Rebecca, who was her and her husband, uh, Pastor Rebecca and Pastor Rick, they're phenomenal marriage counselors. I'm sure you've seen that in experience where you've seen where couples have been like, oh, it's fine. It'll work itself out. It's whatever. And they just keep brushing it under the rug <laughs> because there's pride there. And if you're not careful, that pride will cost you pr your position in your marriage just like it costs Satan his position in heaven. And it's no different. I see it in all types of different places. Even with, with, even with kids, I see kids that, that just won't obey their parents sometimes. And even into their teenage years when they really, really reach the, a cage of, or the age of accountability and they know what they're doing and they just keep making these decisions and, and these rebellious decisions. And what they don't realize is, is they're just setting themselves up for failure. They're setting themselves up. And I see this happen all the time. And then they go through hardship, they go through trouble, and I'm like, you don't understand. If you would just be obedient, if you would just live an honorable life, I'm not saying that you have to be perfect, nobody's perfect, but if you would just honor God, and through honoring God, honor your mother, honor your father, honor those authorities that have been placed over you. Satan had a problem with authority. Do you understand? This is, this is his tactic. He wants pride to set in your heart. And the only reason he wants pride in your heart because pride can get you to disrespect and dishonor authority. Because pride says you're better than the authorities that have been placed over you. And that is his tactic. So, no matter what, no matter what temptations come your way, no matter what hits you in life and you're thinking to yourself, well, I, I don't know what's happening or I, I don't know what decision to make or I don't know what to do. Just think back to that strategy and think to yourself, well, how can I honor God in this? What is the best way that I can honor God in this? So if you have a, an issue in your marriage, well, think to just pray that. Say, God, how can I honor you right now in this? And the Holy Spirit will give you the answer and you do what he says, right? And that expels the snares of the enemy. That literally expels all right, it, it, and, and let's, let's go back here, and I want us to finish reading the rest of Ephesians here because the Bible actually breaks down exactly how you stand against the schemes of the devil. It says, stand firm then with the belt of truth, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. How many of you have ever done the, the uh, armor prayer with Pastor Rhonda or anyone here where she goes through and she says, I put on the belt of truth, and what does she always say after that? Because I reproduce truth in the kingdom all right it's no coincidence that the the belt is the belt of truth and the belt happens to be around the reproduction area we don't have to go into detail but you understand what i'm saying but you have to reproduce truth so when you're in those situations ask yourself say or ask god say god what is the truth of the matter what am i supposed to do right now what is what does the truth say? Because the truth, if you let it reign free in your life, then the Bible actually says the truth will set you free. So I don't think it's any coincidence that the truth is around the reproduction area. And then it also says with the breastplate of righteousness, righteousness, right standing with God. It's no coincidence that the breastplate covers the heart. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. To, car, to guard your heart. We have to guard our hearts. Then it says, fitted with the feet, or, the, or I'm sorry, with the shoes of the gospel of peace. And Pastor Rhonda likes to say, wherever I go, what? Come on, wherever I go, wherever I go, peace shows up. He orders the steps of the righteous, and wherever you go, peace shows up. You know, I think it's crazy that peace is related to the shoes. I'm just thinking in terms of like fighting because I'm a, I'm a huge MMA guy. I know all kinds, I'm joking, I'm really joking. I don't know a thing about fighting. How many of you did I fool? Huh? How many of you were like, oh, he must know karate. He's a black belt. That's crazy. But I'm telling you, like, and, and I know punches, punches can knock you out. I, I hear that. But I'm telling you, the leg, when you just... You just kick someone. This is like, and help me out, Sarah Beth. Uh, this, I've got a CrossFit question for you. But isn't the leg and the muscles of the leg like some of the strongest muscles in your body, right? All right? So, so if I take, and I just whack, and I kick somebody with my foot, 
all right, it's probably going to hurt a lot more than if I were to try to land a punch on them, right? Okay? And I think it's crazy that the Bible relates the shoes to peace. Maybe God is telling us we don't need to fight so much. And we don't need to kick people down so much. Maybe you need an attitude check. And maybe God's telling you that you need to put on some shoes of peace and not some shoes of just kicking everybody around and always getting in a fussy. What do kids do when kids get fussy, huh? You've seen it. Arr! Them feet just start going, right? Arr! You know, I've seen it before. You try to pick them up. What do they do? Their legs are kicking. They're trying everything they can. Them feet are going around. And I feel like in the spirit, that's us sometimes. When God's trying to, to, to align us and God's trying to get us to be obedient and he's trying to, to direct us and we're over here just, we got our shoes of tantrum on and not our shoes of peace. So we got to have on the shoes of peace. <laughs> Somebody just texted me and said, Clip Evan doing that on video. <laughs> it says, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. With it, you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You know the crazy thing about arrows? They're very stealthy. How many of you ever ever seen in the movies, all right, and I know I'm relating this to the movies because I'm not really a soldier or nothing like that, but arrows are quiet, and you can't see them coming until they're already there. And that's exactly how the enemy works. He's subtle. He's subtle. That's why it relates to an arrow. And you can extinguish all the fiery arrows of the enemy but you've got to have faith that you can do this. I think a lot of times people don't believe that the power of God is as strong as it is. But I'm telling you, you can conquer this. You can overcome whatever it is you're facing. You've just got to have faith in the power of God. You've got to know. You have to have faith in the power of God. Um, one time I had went to visit someone in the hospital. It was like one of the first times I'd ever in ministry went to visit the, uh, someone in the hospital. We went, I went with my pastor at the time and we went to pray for this lady and we go in and I'm in there and she's got like all these tubes and all these cables and all this stuff hooked up to her. And I'm just standing over there and I'm just like, all right, all right, we're about to do this, about to pray. And I'm just looking around and I'm seeing like all the stuff in the hospital. I'm just like, man, look at all these tubes, all these machines what is all this? And then I'm looking and I'm seeing her and she's clearly in pain, you know, and she can barely talk and she's got the you know, tube in her mouth and everything all that. And, and I started getting hot. I was like, man, a little hot in here. And then I started getting a little dizzy. And I was just like, and I, I had no idea what's happening to me, by the way, right now. I'm just looking around like that. And then I'm like, I, I, I told my husband, I gotta step out real quick. I'm, I'm I, I, I told my husband, I gotta it's a little hot in here. So I step out into the hallway. As soon as I step out to the hallway, next thing you know, everything goes white. And I wake up, and there's like five nurses standing over me, just people, faces. And I'm like, oh, what happened? <laughs> and they were like, you passed out. And they said I literally, they saw me walk out to the middle of the hallway of the hospital, and I just went, shoo, and my head just hit that hard hospital floor. Just no barrier, nothing stopped me, just straight, and, and I'm like, what? and that's what's wrong with me till today, you know? That's why, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Hannah's like, that's what it is. No. Um, so I, I pass out, and then I get up, and they had to, like, wheel me over with the wheelchair and, like, check my blood pressure, all this stuff. And, and I was not, I was very, like, skinny. I was like a toothpick, okay? I was really tiny at this time, and I know that's hard to believe. Um, so it wasn't like I had like high blood pressure or nothing like that. And I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm like, what happened? And they're like, I don't, we don't know what, what triggered it. I said, well, I saw all the stuff in the, in the room and I don't know, maybe that just kind of got to me. And then I realized I had some type of phobia with hospitals because the next day, and this isn't good for me because I work at a pharmacy, right? And they just opened up a medical clinic next to the pharmacy. So like a doctor's office and stuff. And this really started messing with me to the point to where I wouldn't even go over to the, hospital, to the medical clinic after that to take a prescription or anything like that. Because I was scared if I went over there and saw anything that resembled a, a doctor's office or hospital or any machines, I would pass out. And then I started like getting like anxiety attacks where I, I would... I would you know, just see something or I'd think, and I would just, oh, and finally one day my pastor was like, man, we got to slay this thing. And I was like, what are you talking about, man? This is like a condition I have. Like, I don't, this is like, this is like something I've got. Like, I don't, you know, I, 
I did, I did what most of us do, and, and we try to take ownership of our problems, and we try to use them as like our pets. This is my thing. This is my depression. This is my anxiety. It's mine. And it gets me a lot of attention from people. And if I give it up, then people won't pay me attention. Could it be that my depression is actually from a root of pride? Because the more I'm depressed, the more people have to pay attention to me and try to help me out of my depression. I'm not trying to be rude here. I'm just trying to be real. A lot of times we take ownership of our problems and we take them on as like pets. And as long as we have those things, and I'm telling you, it's just one trick he has. One trick the enemy has. And it all funnels back down to pride. Why do you think he wants you depressed? Because when you're depressed or you're suicidal or you have these things, what do you do? You need people's attention. You need people's affirmation to try to tell you, no, you're amazing. You're great. You're, you're so awesome. Please don't be depressed. Like you have no reason to be depressed. And I'm, I'm not saying that we can't go alongside of people and try to help pull them out of the pit. That's not what I'm saying. But when you see it, it's a reoccurring thing with someone where they're always going in and out of that anxiety or in and out of that depression or in and out of that suicidal state and it's just constant with that person and they won't get deliverance, those type of people are holding on to that thing like a pet. And what it does is it feeds their pride and they don't even realize it feeds their pride. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So, so, so I, I kind of got off on, on a tangent here, but so you take up the shield of faith and this is why it's so important to have faith because what happens is the more and more you cling and hold on to that thing, the more and more you think it has power over you. And you don't have the faith in God to break that thing over your life because you feel like you're too far gone. You're like, no, this thing's been with me. It's been a part of me for too long. I just can't break this thing. I can't shake this thing. But you have to raise up the shield of faith because it's your faith that is going to quench and extinguish those attacks of the enemy. And you have to say, I have faith in this. So, so circling back to the hospital ordeal, I was like, no, I have this condition, Pastor. I da, da, da. And he was like, no, no, you don't. This is an attack from the enemy. Let's pray this thing. Let's slay this thing. I was like, okay. So we prayed right there on the altar. We were at the church, and we, we went down, and we prayed at the altar. He anointed me all. We said, he said, you, I break, you, know, you were broke free from this thing. You're no longer going to allow this thing to operate in you, da, 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 da. And then he looked at me, and he said, now, all you have to do is when you're back in those situations or you're going to a hospital or you're doing whatever, you just have to quote the word. And the Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie. So if God said that you're free, then he's not lying. You're free. So this is literally what I had to do to break this thing. Is Because you got to understand the altar is, is where the altar is where the breaking happens but there still has, there's a process after it. You can't just come to the altar and have your little moment with the Lord and cry your few tears and think that, oh, well, I'm good to go now. All right? Think of it like an egg. You crack an egg. There's a breaking that takes place, but you still have to cook that thing. There's a process, right, after the breaking. So I go to the hospital, and this is me the whole time walking through the hospital halls. God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a man that he should lie. I'm quoting this constantly. God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a man that he should lie. And, and literally from that day on, I never, ever passed out in a hospital again because of that. Now, you draw my blood, <laughs> I'm out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hannah will tell you I'm out. I'm, it's, it's, that's just a, yeah, it's that thing or whatever. But um, she... <laughs> Y'all are going to come up and pray for me to be broken from that uh, after service. She one time, she was like, don't be silly. She had never been with me before to get blood drawn, and we had to go to an appointment one day. And she's like, I was like, I told the nurse, I said, can, can I lay down? I have to lay down because it just gets me, and I pass out and all. And she's like, okay, baby, okay. And then we go into the, the room, and it was kind of embarrassing because the table that people lay on, I guess they don't use it that much. 
because there was a bunch of files all over it and stuff. So we go in there. She's like cleaning it up, you know, and all the stuff. And I'm just standing there like this. And she's like wiping it down. There's cobwebs everywhere. I'm just like, okay, this is kind of embarrassing. So I lay down on it and everything. And Hannah's like, I think you could do this. I think you could sit up in the chair. I really think you're fine. I was just like, okay, all right. So I sit up in the chair. <laughs> Soon as they put the rubber thing on me, that gets me. The, the rubber band, mm-mm, because I know it's coming. And then it gets worse when the alcohol swab. You know, you know what's coming. And, and then, and I know what they're doing. They're trying to talk you through it. They're like, so how's your day? How's it going? I'm like, I know what you're doing right now. And I will not fall for this, Denise. So tell me what you're going to eat lunch today what's going on all this stuff and I'm just like mm. and I feel the alcohol swab and then they always go little prick they kind of talk you through it little stick and I'm just like as soon as that happens I'm out and Hannah's just she sees my eyes roll the back of my head I'm like mm, like that and I come to and she goes baby I'll never make you sit in a chair again I'm so sorry that was the scariest thing in my life I thought you were gone I didn't know well I didn't really know this was a thing I'm so sorry and I was just like Well, thank you for admitting you were wrong. You don't have pride. Amen. <laughs> Stand to your feet. <laughs> it's about that time. Um, so my biggest, my biggest prayer, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to literally do this altar call really, really different. I'm going to do it the way I did it that night, young adults, because this is what I want to, this is the, the point I want to bring home with you, is I want you to understand this. Most of the time, yes, God wants us to break free. God wants us to work on our stuff. God has, you know, and then we have the altar for these moments where we can come and we can work these things out. We can lay these things down, and, and that's a beautiful process. I love every bit of that. One of my, just, it gives me so much joy, especially because where we are, we get like this bird's eye view of the altar and the breakthrough that people are getting and we can see it on your faces we can see the holy spirit moving in your life and it's such a beautiful thing but i want to do something a little bit different i want the focus of the altar to be slightly different this morning than maybe we're used to and i don't want anyone to come to the altar and to focus on anything about you this morning what i would love is if we could all just come to the altar and just worship him and just lift him up. Fix our eyes on him. Don't ask for nothing. Don't bring up your junk. Don't none of that stuff. Because here's what I know. More times than not, if we approach the altar that way, we would get our freedom a lot quicker and a lot more efficient. If we just fix our eyes on him. Can we do that? If, if, if where you're at or if you want to come down to the altar, can we just lift him up? And I don't know if we're going to sing a song or not. I have no idea, but, but you don't need a, a song lyrics to worship him. But just lift him up. He's so deserving. He's so worthy of the praise. Oh, we love you, Lord. Just imagine if Lucifer would have done that if he would have just lifted up God and he would have said, God, you're higher than any other. Can we do that now? That's why the enemy hates me and you so much. It's because we took his place. Who does the worship now? Who exalts God now? Just fix your eyes on him. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord.